Welcome back. So our first section in chapter one, which is not our first chapter, but in chapter one, the functions chapter, is going to have a lot of vocabulary in it and a lot of concepts. So just kind of bear with me. Um, a lot of it could be familiar to what you already know. We're just going to have a really good grasp of these topics when we finish up this unit. So the subset of real numbers, we're, we already talked about the fact that there is an imaginary or complex number system, but we're going to talk just about real numbers here. So that are real numbers include rationals, which they signify by that weird Q, uh, irrationals, which they signify with an I, integers Z, whole numbers W, the only one that you know, starts to make sense, and natural numbers N. Um, so if we think about what those numbers are, a rational number, get my mouse to work, oh, close that. Uh, a rational number is anything that could be written as a fraction. So the most obvious, you know, kind of question or sample of a rational number would be two-thirds, a fraction. Uh, but remember, four is also a rational number because that could be written as a fraction, four over one. Um, zero is a rational number. Um, anything that could be written as a fraction. So if you have a repeating decimal, so like 0.33 repeating can be written as one-third and so on and so on. So irrational, remember, are things that cannot be written as fractions because they don't have any sort of um, repetition in their decimal. So pi, very famous irrational number. E, another famous irrational number. Um, you know, things that are weird square roots or cube roots or whatever. So like the square root of three would be really funky and a non-repeating decimal. Integers would be oops, my positive and negative whole numbers. So like negative three, negative two, negative one, zero is an integer, um, one, two, and three. Whole numbers are just the positive integer list, uh, including zero. So zero, one, two, three, and then so on, so on. And then natural numbers are the counting numbers. So if you think about when you first started to learn how to count when you're a little baby, no one counts with zero at the beginning. Uh, kids always start with one. So one, two, three, yada, yada, yada. So integers not including zero, uh, sorry, whole numbers not including zero. So there's a nice visual for um, the subset of real numbers. So that whole entire box there is what they consider real numbers. Notice we're not talking about complex in any way. But uh, if you remember Q stood for rational numbers. So integers, whole numbers, and natural numbers are all like set within each other. So they are all rational numbers. Um, irrational numbers are kind of off to their own side on this diagram because they're not going to follow under any of those. So back in the day, your teacher might have had you do something fun where they gave you a number and they said, please list um, all possible classifications for this number. So if they gave you a number like two, like that is a rational number, it's an integer, it's a whole number, it's a natural number. So you had to list off a lot of things. So here's some nice examples. This is not on your paper and pencil notes. So if you just are really, really speaks to you, um, it might be in your textbook, I'm not sure. Uh, but you could take a screenshot of that if you love it. So if we're setting a list, if we're trying to describe a set of numbers, you know, we don't, we, if they're infinite, we can't list them. So we have to somehow build up the set and we can use the set builder notation or interval notation. Now, most normal people in the world use interval notation because it's a lot easier to write, but set builder notation means the same thing. The only issue for set builder notation is that if you translate it to like, human speak, it's really weird. <laughs> so um, this vertical line is an abbreviation for such that. So we can read this as uh, all numbers x such that <laughs> numbers are greater than 18 and that your number is uh, an element of the real number system. That was a very specific way to list those out. Um, but for most people, they would just write that as 18 to infinity because if you think about a number line, all my numbers that are greater than 18 um, oops, that's an 18. On um, you know, there's a lot of numbers between 18 and 19. We can't possibly list them all. But if we don't include 18 and include everything above it in the number line, that would be written in interval notation as 18 to infinity. Um, notice the parentheses on 18 because 18 is not a listing. You hear that? All right. So interval notation much easier in my opinion. There's a nice translation of what that builder notation looks like. The good news is I am not going to make you do set builder notation on any sort of assessment. 
So remember for um, inequality, translating to interval notation, we could we could write any of them in either order, either method. Um, you have to watch your parentheses and your bracket usage. So that should be a nice refresher. Infinities always have parentheses. So again, I don't think this diagram is um, in your notes at all, but it is in your textbook, I believe, and you can just take a screenshot. So next, some examples. So it says write each set of numbers in interval notation. So forget the set builder notation business. All my numbers that are less than or equal to negative two. So for a lot of kids, they could draw this in a number line when they first learn interval notation, but all my numbers less than or equal to negative two would go all the way back to negative infinity and then stop at negative two, including negative two. So we're going to put a bracket. All my numbers greater than negative 8.8. .8. Um, so this time we're going to start at negative 8.8 .8 .8 with a parenthesis because we're not including it and then keep going up and up so to infinity. All my numbers between 5 and 15, not including 5 or 15, would be an inclusive interval like this. Nice and easy. And then the ORs are always fun because they have um, a jump, so you have to use a union symbol. So all my numbers that are less than negative 11 or any number that's greater than or equal to 1. So any number that's less than negative 11 would start all the way back at negative infinity, going up to negative 11, not including it. And then you're going to jump over a whole lot of numbers, like negative 10, negative 9, all the numbers in between. Um, and you're going to pick up again at 1, including 1 as a solution, so bracket, and then go all the way to infinity. More vocab. How fun. So the domain and range of a relation, um, we're going to also talk about the difference between a relation and a function in the near future. But a domain represents generally the uh, x values, the range represents the y values, and the x is the independent variable, and the y is the dependent variable. So that's the vocab that you might see a lot in your science classes. Independent means that, you know, as a scientist or the statistician or the, the data person, um, you're, you're changing or you're measuring um, the difference in the x's because of what's occurring, and then something's happening, and you're also going to measure out the y. That's the, in, um, the dependent variable is the y because it's depending on the change in the x. So it's kind of weird, weird notation. Um, let's talk about a function. So a relation, I can't remember if we already did this lesson, but a relation is literally anything that can be graphed um, in a coordinate plane. So it has an input and an output, at least one input and one output. So if you have a function and you have at A and set B in this case. The domain would be all the independent variables, or in this case, set A, which we know as the X's, and then this would be like Y. So a relation is a function if there's only one pairing um, for every X. So each of these X's can only be paired up twice. So in this example here, this relation, I look at the pairings of X to Y, X to Y, X, oh, oh right here, look at this. A lot of kids freak out because they're like, wait a minute. What's happening with um, 2 and 3 both being pairs of 8? Well, that's okay because the definition says every x has only um, exactly one element in y. It doesn't say anything about the reverse being true. So because every x is only paired once with one y value, this would be considered a function. Furthermore, they would say, what is the domain? Now, this is not a continuous function. This is just a listing of ordered pairs. So assuming that it wasn't some sort of continuous function, this was the whole set. The domain is just a listing of your x values. So notice the notation with those weird squiggly brackets. Um, these are called set notation brackets. Take a little practice, right? But you don't want to use parentheses because that indicates many things in math, but not this. And you don't want to use brackets because, again, it indicates intervals. So you want to use set notation. The range is the listing of the y. Notice that y value, that um, the 8, I think it was, didn't show up twice in that list. They just listed it once. So that's um, if you have a listing of points, that's an easy way to tell if it's a function or not. But if your relation is graphed on the coordinate plane, there's a really easy way to tell if it's a function, and that's if it passes the vertical line test. So the idea is anytime you graph a vertical line anywhere on the coordinate plane, it can only touch one ordered pair at a time. And that's essentially saying the same thing as the other test, where it said every x only has one y. Because if you think about, like, for instance, it doesn't exist here, but let's pretend there's a point right here. These two ordered pairs have the same x value. So, like, if this was x equals 3, I'm just making that up. 
So three would be paired with one, uh, making it up. <laughs> and three would be paired with three. Again, I'm making it up. So in that case, that particular X was paired twice. It wouldn't have been a function, but the example they provided us was a function. So let's look at some examples. So this first one is just a listing of ordered pairs. It is not a continuous uh, any sort of function, if it is a function at all. All we're going to look for is are there any x's that are paired twice? So negative 8 paired, uh, negative 5 paired. Nothing's paired more than once for the x's. So yes, this is a function. And you can abbreviate whoops, function f to the n. This next one is graphed for us because it is continuous, so they couldn't possibly list out all the ordered pairs. But notice, they drew a nice vertical line through the particular relation. And this vertical line here would definitely intersect the relation twice, meaning that x equals 4. So like this is what? 4, like, I don't know, 1.5. Um, and this is for something else. I don't know, 2, negative 2 point something. Whatever it is, I don't care. Because what I notice here is, whoops, the x is 4 is paired with two different outputs, two different y values, and that's why it is not a function. Visually, we can say that it fails the vertical line test, so it is not a function. So if you have an algebraic representation of your relation, that's a little trickier to figure out. Um, definitely, I'm a visual person, so if I could, I would I would prefer to graph it and do the vertical line test. Um, sometimes you just have to kind of muscle through the algebra of it, though, and that's tough. So this example here, they did a little work to rearrange the equation so they solved for y. So they added 2x, they square rooted both sides, remembering plus or minus. And this is a little bit tricky because if you think of, like, plugging in anything for x here, it's going to have both a positive and negative y value output, so it's going to produce two different y values every single time, unless it's zero. So this is not a function. If you graphed it, it would look like a sideways parabola. Just FYI. So it would definitely fail the vertical line test. So this one's interesting because there's no algebra. <laughs> it's a real world example. So an input value x is a student's ID number. And an output value y is a student's score on a physics exam. So they've already answered this for you. Each value of x can be assigned to more than one y value. I cannot, excuse me. <laughs> Thought that was weird. Um, so that way we would claim that this is a function. So in other words, if the id number is the x value, I can't possibly say, you know, this student scored two different scores on this test if they only took it one time. So this would definitely be considered a function. Vertical line test. Da, 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 da. Oh, can be used um, on the graph, yeah. <laughs> so um, for this example, draw a graph of a function and then draw a graph that is not a function. So unfortunately, there's a lot of different things you could come up with. So if this was like a test question, it would be really fun to grade, right? So a function, like a line, totally a function, as long as it wasn't vertical. Um, a parabola shifted anywhere. Totally a function, if I could draw. Any sort of um, polynomial. So that would be like a cubic graph function. But let's talk about things that are not functions. So we just discovered that a sideways parabola, you know, something that looks like this, not a function. You guys might remember that we can graph circles in the coordinate plane. Not function. Um, man, there's a lot. Oh, you know what? Another good one that is a function I didn't talk about yet? The absolute value function. Remember him? Good one. I mean, it's called the absolute value function. So, the... All right. So, example two. Let's look at um, function, and then we're going to evaluate a function at specific values. So, evaluating this function at negative four. For most people, they would pull out their handy-dandy calculator because no one wants to do this in their brain. Oh, especially me, because it's very late. I'm tired. All right, so negative 4 to the third power is negative 64. 4 times negative 64 is something. I don't know. I already did this problem, guys. I think I got negative 172. Oh, this showed up on any sort of a test. SAT test. 
um, ACT test, my test. Unless it was calculator free, yeah, I'd, I'd expect you to use a calculator. But this one, we're not going to be able to use a calculator for. So in your function, you're going to evaluate it at 2a. So every time you see an x, you're going to replace it with 2a. So this is fun. When you cube and square the expression 2a, you have to remember to do both the 2 and the a. So like this first part here becomes 4 times 8, a to the third. I'm going to go ahead and simplify that to 32 a to the third. And then this will become 4a squared. So 6 times 4a squared is 24a squared plus 6a. So that is the multiplied version of that evaluated function. We'd move on. So this next one is very similar. In fact, I think it's the same problem. <laughs> move on. One. All right, back up one. So this next function, g of x, is what we refer to as a piecewise function. So depending on the domain in which you're evaluating, you're going to be at different parts of the function. We'll, we'll talk more about these and what they look like when you graph them later. But if your x value is less than or equal to 4, your function is going to follow the recipe of square root of x plus 1. If your x is between 4 and 10, notice there's no equal to bars in this, so it has to be greater than 4 or less than 10, not including. You're going to evaluate the function with recipe 3x. And then if your x value is greater than or equal to 10, notice the equal to bar, you're going to be evaluating at the recipe 2x squared minus 15. So for g of 1, that means we're evaluating the function at 1. And I think about, you know, what rule does that follow? 1 is definitely less than 4. So evaluating this top piece of the piecewise function, square root of 1, 1, plus 1 is 2. g of 3 also less than 4, so we're still at the top function here. So it'd be, ew, square root of 3 plus 1, so whatever that is. Um, and then g of 6 is between 4 and 10. So we're going to be looking here at the middle piece of the piecewise function. 3 times 6 would be 18. And then 10. Remember, the equal to 10 part was on the bottom, that green function here. So evaluating the last piece of the piecewise function at 10 would be 2 times 10 squared, so 2 times 100, 200, <laughs> minus 15 would be 1, 8. Five. All right. Totally, totally keyed this before. Except I keyed it wrong. This is concerning. All right. <laughs> Let's talk about the next function. x squared minus 8x plus 1. And it says evaluate the function at negative 1. Now, I know this sounds really stupid to ask a pre-calc kid, but you'd be surprised how many kids do this wrong because they just type negative 1 squared minus 8. Well, yeah, it doesn't work that way. You have to put negative 1 in parentheses if you're going to trust your calculator to do it right. So this is where we talk about, like, while technology is awesome, sometimes it helps kind of use your brain. You guys know negative 1 squared is 1. Um, negative 8 times negative 1 would be a plus 8, and then plus 1. So this evaluated function comes out to 10. So for part B, you can use your calculator for a little bit of it, but you're not going to be able to rely on it. So instead of x squared minus 8x plus 1, we're evaluating the function at x. So remember that when you're squaring 2x, you got to square the 2 and the x. So it's 4x squared becomes a minus 16x and a plus 1. I love this. Those are my favorite. Oh, I don't love this. But let's do it anyway. <laughs> All right, so same function. This time we evaluate it at x plus 8. This one's not too bad. Um, there are some problems on your homework worksheet that are just awful. I mean, I hope if you're watching this, and you've already like seen the assignment. I hope I was nice enough to like cut some problems off because they're just really bad. All right, x plus 8 squared, if I'm squaring a, a binomial, that's really a foiling problem or distrib distribution problem. So it's like x plus 8 times another x plus 8. So that becomes x squared. That'll be plus 16x plus 64. And then this next part, I have to distribute the negative 8. So negative 8x minus 64. That works out kind of nice. And plus 1. So if I'm simplifying this expression, there's a little bit of simplifying here. The 64s will knock out. The x's collect to make 8x. So it's x squared plus 8x plus 1. Like I said, there's some real nasty problems coming your way on a worksheet in the future. So fingers crossed that I said. All right, this next piecewise function um, is the top function recipe. If your x's are less than 3, the middle guy is between 
3 and 8, including 3, but not including 8. And then if you're 8 or bigger, you're going with this bottom function, which is a constant function. So uh, evaluating this function at 3, that would fall into this middle category here. So 2 times 3 plus 10, getting more and more tired, so i got to think a little harder at 16. And then evaluating the function at 8.5, well, that's greater than 8. So normally I'd say, like, float it into that bottom function recipe. Well, 42 is constant, which means the answer is always going to be 42 in that function. If I graphed it, it'd be a little horizontal ray in this case. So the answer for that one is going to come out to 42. Or equals. Fun. I love piecewise functions. They're crazy. All right, let's talk about this. If the input is a card's license plate number, the output is your car's make and model. My question is, is this a function? So the, the issue is, can a license plate number be assigned to two different cars? And I know some of you are new drivers, but I think you know that the answer to that is no. They can't be assigned to two different cars. That's silly. So um, this is a function. So we'll see, yeah. I don't know. Uh, this next one, does it pass the vertical line test? It would. If I could draw a vertical line really well, I'd totally draw them for you, but just trust me. Um, number nine, this one obviously is going to fail the vertical line test. That's just one example of a failure. So I'll be honest, if you just wrote no, that's not a function, like I'm not real happy with that answer on a test, I'm probably going to make you explain it. So I'd say like something like it fails the vertical line test. And because I'm lazy, I'll abbreviate. So it's not a function. You could say things like specific x values have, you know, these two different y values. There's lots of ways you could explain it. This makes it super fun to grade, right? So when you are given a function with an unspecified domain, domain excuse me, <laughs> implied domain, it's a set of all real numbers for which the function is defined. So there's a few algebraic problem areas that we have to look at. And one of them would be if it results in a divide by zero situation. So if you have a a rational setup where your denominator could somehow come out to a zero if I do a little backwards algebra. That's going to be a problem for my implied domain. And then the other issue that we're going to run into is if you have some sort of an even root, so a square root or a fourth root, whatever is inside the root, it can't be negative. It could be zero, it could be like 0 0.0001, it could be all sorts of things that are positive, but it cannot be a negative because that would produce complex numbers. So those are the two issues that we're going to be looking at. If neither of those are problems, then we're going to say that the domain are all reals or negative infinity to infinity. So this is a good example of we're definitely going to have an issue. I don't see any even root, like a square root or a fourth root, but I definitely see a denominator. And if that denominator um, is equal to zero, we're going to have a major, major problem. That's exactly what I set up. I figure out, I kind of tackle my problems, right? I say, what would make this equal zero? And I solve. Well, this is a quadratic, which I would solve by factoring out the x. And then I would take each factor. So x equals 0 is one solution. And then x minus 6 equals 0 would give you a solution of x cannot be 6. And notice I said cannot be. So that I'm going to draw a little cannot <laughs> does not equal things in between. So in interval notation, this is super fun. You ready for this? Everything except for 0 and 6. So like all the way back to negative infinity. Totally fine. And then we're all good until you hit zero. But I can't include zero, so I'm going to use a parenthesis. And then I'm going to jump <laughs> over zero. And I'm going to pick it up again on the other side of zero. So, like, 0 0.001. Good. Um, and then I'm totally golden until I hit number six. And then I got a problem. I got to jump over six. <laughs> and then I'm great for the rest of time. So another way that we could say that domain is you could say all reals, which that's kind of the symbol for real, weird, right? Um, and then put like a comma, and then x cannot equal zero or x. So I know most of you are like, wait, the set builder notation thing was like super easy. Like the interval notation was more difficult. You don't have the luxury of like doing one, not the other. You have to understand that they're both okay which means I, as your teacher, have to understand they're both okay, unless I indicate in the directions you must use one notation. So this one says, determine if each relation is a function. Then if it's a function, we're going to state the domain and range in interval notation notice. So 
again, very visual. If I knew what this looked like on a graph, I'd be fine. So I'm going to solve for y in pretty much all of these. I'm going to add the x over, so it'd be like y equals 4x. And that's a line, and I, you know, a line with a slope of 4. So it looks like this, and that would totally pass the vertical line test. So, oops, that was supposed to be a yes. <laughs> Which means, yay, I can come up with the domain and range. Well, there's no implied domain problems. There's no denominator. There's no square root or a fourth root. So the domain is all real. It's negative infinity to infinity. And the range is all real. It's negative infinity to infinity. Again, you got a graphing calculator, so if you really were in a jam, you could just graph it. But hopefully you guys have a little bit of memory of what the line 4x looks like. Um, the square root graph, and if I graphed it, I think it's like reflected. Like, I think it looks um, like something like this. I don't know exactly. I haven't done the algebra yet, but something like this. Okay. So <clears throat> I'm going to do algebra in a minute because I know from square root graphs, there's a definite like domain and range interruption going on. Let's talk about um, domain. Because algebraically, I know that this is a square root, which means the stuff inside the square root has to be greater than or equal to zero. So if I solve this, I'd add the 2 over. And then remember when you divide by a negative, this inequality flips. So my domain would be all my numbers, all my axes that are less than or equal to negative 2 thirds. So I actually graphed pretty well. Yay, go me. So that would be negative infinity. The negative two thirds. Notice it's an equal to bar because you can have a square root of zero. That's an okay number. The range, however, um, I probably would have like thought really hard about this. But <laughs> if the domain ends at negative two thirds, that's the last point here. And if I think about plugging in a negative two thirds here, that's what provided the the square root of zero part of that. So the y value that this function will come out to at negative two thirds for x is y equals zero. So the range starts at zero and then goes up forever. So there we go, domain and range. Again, you have a graphing calculator, so you could you know, really test some theories out on that graphing calculator if you thought you knew it. Next one is not solve for y. All right, so let's do that. Divide by 5, and then we'd square root both sides, and then we'd have to add the 1 over. Okay, so... I should have talked about the plus or minus, though, huh? Um, for most kids, they have no idea what this looks like, and I think I um, cheated. <laughs> I think I graphed it. So I think in Y1, I graphed, like, um, the square root of X over 5 plus 1, and then in Y2, I graphed negative square root of X over 5 plus 1. Um, and it turns out it's a sideways parabola when you graph them together, and it's kind of weird because it looks like... Um, They go shifted this way. I'm not sure how exactly it was shifted. I'm about to find out. So. Oh, no, I'm not. Because guess what? This is not a function. It fails a vertical line test. So it's not a function. And because it's not a function, I don't have to find the domain and range. Go me. All right, this next one is going to have some denominator issues as far as domain goes. Remember, your denominator cannot equal zero because that would provide a divide by zero situation, which we can't have. So if I tried to solve this quadratic in this anti-equation, it would factor into x minus 5 times x minus 3 cannot equal 0, which means x cannot be 5 and x cannot be 3. So um, we don't have a lot of experience with graphing these. These are called rational functions. We have a whole chapter coming up later on in the year. Um, but if we talk about the domain for this function, is everything except for 3 and 5. So we could do that interval notation thing where you skip over 3 and 5. So 3 is the first issue that I'm going to hit. I'm going to skip over 3, then I'm going to get to 5, and I'm going to skip over him as well. Um, but some could say, ugh, that's gross, I don't like that. So for domain, they're going to write, um, hmm, I guess we'll just say it like this. All reals, except x cannot equal 3, or five. Okay. So either one of these notations I'm okay with if oh no I'm not because correction said interval notation. So goldfish memory. Alright, so here's some assignments. Um really 
kind of a long assignment. Uh, I'm pretty sure that if this was designed during class, I shortened this quite a bit. Probably what I did was I gave you like one example of every kind that you're going to hit. And then if you decide you want more of a certain kind, you can further on, you know, go through the book and do some more examples of it before you take your, your test. Here's some extra examples of finding domain. Um, so here the issue is the denominator cannot equal zero. So you got to figure that out. Here the issue is what's under here cannot, oh, not, back up, totally can equal zero. Um, but it has to be greater than or equal to zero is the issue. And then this one, you got to be careful here because this denominator, it cannot equal zero. But the other issue is that there's an even root. So normally I would set up like 2x plus 6 has to be greater than or equal to zero. But this time, um, instead of greater than or equal to zero, it can't be zero, remember? So it's only going to be greater than zero. All right. Kids are getting wild. I better stop it. Good luck.